Hello everybody, I'm Raphael Perry and it's time once again to delve into the realms of Steve Jackson's sorcery. Now before we go any further, let's cast that far-seeing spell once again and have a little look at what the Archmage has been up to. As you can see here, the Archmage has been undercoated. I've painted his eyes. Obviously gone a little bit outside the eyeballs, but I'll tidy that up when I do the skin. And the, the brassy golden parts on his headdress have been done, but I haven't done the red yet. I am, however, quite pleased with how the bones on the base have come out. And I've actually been feeling really enthusiastic about painting the base, so hopefully we'll see that base done by the next episode. So here we are, about to enter the inn, and I must say I like the way the colours are shaping up on the Archmage. I did warn you while I was a very slow painter, but hopefully the next painting update will have some significant improvements, where he will look noticeably different. For now though, I'm about to enter this ancient ruined inn, and in all honesty, I, um... Oh, I'm going to come here later, aren't I? They're going to, um, there's going to be like a tower up here somewhere that I can shine down and restore this tower and shine it across to there. Uh, they're going to make those, they're going to make those towers important again, aren't they? Well, for now I get to explore this ancient ruined inn where I spent far too long overthinking the problem. Let's step inside. Also, I'm dressed as a monk, so I need to be asking myself, what would a monk be doing in the citadel of Mampang? Because I need to be acting like one so as not to arouse suspicion. The same goes for any other disguises I may find along the way, and I have been informed there are actually four disguises I can find in this book. You pick your way through the buckled door frame. Inside, you see a large room dotted with tables. Grass peeks up between the floorboards. The roof has collapsed in one corner, and ivy trails down the broken beams, settling on a long counter. I strongly suspect there won't be anyone to hear me if I call. But there might be some animals, or nasty little beasts that would be scared and scurry away, so it's a good way of... as long as I don't call so loudly that everyone nearby hears me. Just to dislodge any potential minor threats. Or spies. There could be rats or mice looking at me from cracks. I, I know I doubt it. I, I think I'll just check behind the counter. Oh no, don't draw my sword, just in case. You draw your sword in readiness, but nothing stirs. This place seems empty. Even the rats have moved on. This must have been an inn. It sits beside a well-trod road, so travellers must have come this way at some point. But it has long since fallen into disrepair. A mug sits on one table, its handle missing. Across the room there is a cramped passage. Well, I'll still look at the bar. You go over to the bar, still littered with the remnants of the inn's daily life. The furnishings are all in bad shape, but from neglect rather than violence. The inn was probably abandoned when the travellers stopped taking this road. Probably when the sorcerer shut down Mampang and made it incredibly unwelcoming. On a shelf underneath the counter, you see a rack of dusty bottles. I will look at the bottles on the rack. Can I cast a sunlight spell? Possibly, but I don't think I need it. You look along the rack. Most of the bottles are wine or exotic ales, but one label catches your eye. Fire water. But the bottle is dry as bone, as are all the others. Yes, I need to find a way to reconstitute this place. What spells are available to me? Tell? Nice idea! Whose minds would I... Does it scan for surrounding minds, or do you need to direct it at a... 
safe passage. The place is old and probably falling down. Doc! Well, if only my potion had not been wasted. Come on, come on. There you go. There you go, of course. This is less the future and more the past, I believe. You settle into a sitting position on the ground and take out the orb of crystal. You weave the spell and suddenly you find yourself somewhere quite new. You see the tavern, but in good repair. A few travellers sit at the tables, sipping drinks. You watch the door open and a young woman enter in, soaked through. The landlord beams at her. Awful night, yes? You headed for to the fortress? She nods. Yes, I am to study. My name is Valakesh. That's probably Valakesh, but it's a Q-U, so I'll keep listening. I'm not going to introduce myself. They'll notice I'm here. And I'm supposed to be viewing secretly, spying, learning what I can. You stay quiet and listen. Oh, good. Good, replies the landlord, cheerfully putting an arm around the young woman. Plenty stay here on their way. Few return, but never mind that. Come in and rest. If you leave early tomorrow, you will be there before sunset. The vision fades as the woman accepts a bowl of stew. Was this an echo of the past or a happier future? It could be both. I'll have a search around and see what I can find. You make a quick search of the corners and rubble piles, unearthing a mouldering piece of paper and a few coins. I'll examine the paper. The coins aren't going anywhere. The paper is flimsy with age, the writing faded. You only manage to make out a few lines. The beckoning finger welcomes you, sorcerer, to the last resting place before the fortress. A hot meal is two bronze pieces and a cup of ale, and comes with a cup of ale. Bread and cheese are one bronze piece. It seems unlikely the prices are still valid, however, and there are no beacons here to help you rebuild the place. But I could still pick up the coins and hope they aren't, like, covered with acid or something. Hunching over, you pick up the coins and examine them. They are very thin, bronze, green with age. On the one side is a simple picture of a bird of prey, talons outstretched. On the other, there is a profile of a hook-nosed man with a stern expression. There is writing along the edge of the portrait, but you don't recognise the language. I've got a spell for that. Are they simply ancient, or from a faraway land? But in your travels in the past, you have never seen a coin like this, or another portrait of this woman. Hang on. Oh, hook-nosed woman. The archmage is a man. The hook-nosed, yeah, I think so. Let's cast a spell. It's not law, but I think it begins with an L. I don't think that spell is available right now. Um, look, it costs nothing. I've got the item. Consulting the stars, you bind the magic, pulling on the cloth skullcap as you do. Nothing arrives into your mind, but there is something coming from the far passage. A hint of thought wafts through the room. I will move in that direction. You could explore the hallway or leave. You make your way down the hallway. It leads to several back rooms, but most have collapsed, and now only the nearest two are accessible. One is smaller, only containing a single bed. Let's look around, especially under the bed. You look around the empty room and discover a handle in the ground. A trap door leading to some kind of cellar, perhaps. The back rooms are almost certainly more wreck than ruin. Cellar last, because I don't want to get locked in. 
private room first. It might be of enough quality that someone round here would... Oh, mirror. Magic mirror, trap mirror, maybe. Nasty, nasty head distorting mirror like in Death Trap Dungeon. I think not. I don't remember that repeating, but then this does seem to be somewhat new material. Upon first glance through the doorway, the room at the back appears to be a private bedchamber, but as you enter you see signs of violence. Unlike the front room, the furniture is smashed and possessions lie scattered about. Half a mirror still hangs in a frame and pieces of splintered wood litter the ground. Ha oh, one of the spells does require a mirror, but I imagine half of one won't be enough. Look in the mirror. You look into the foggy mirror, noticing how much the journey has aged you. Then, over your shoulder, you catch a gl glimpse of something movement. Something. Movement. Turn around. Bright eyes. Every now and then we need it. You whip around, but see nothing. Interesting. Examine the furnishings. You peer at the smashed furnishings, picking up the leg of a chair. It all seems somewhat deliberate. You cannot think of a scuffle that would produce such an effect as this. It looks rather as if someone attacked the furnishings directly. I will look at the bed. The bed is the only thing untouched. On the bed, among the moth-eaten sheets, sits a note, and if I bend over, the invisible person who's only visible in the mirror might bash me one. Uh, let's risk it. You pick up the, you pick up the note off the bed. You pick up the note from the bed. You pick up, you pick the note off the bed. It does up and off together in the same sentence and read it. Horrors, it reads. Surrounded by horrors. I have discovered the tavern is haunted. I must flee. If you read this, heed my warnings. Run! Run now! A voice pipes up behind you. But it's fake, you know. I turn around. You turn around, but no one is there. Still the voice pipes up, this time from the hallway. He worked on that for a whole afternoon, it says. It sounds like a young girl. I will wait. I won't confront. You wait in the room, hand straying to your blade. Nothing happens. Are you still there? The voice asks. I hope you are. I've had no one to talk to for so long. Show yourself, you call. I'm out here, the voice responds from the hall, then giggles. <laughs> Come and get me. I'm leaving the room. There is no way out of this room. There's no further way out of this room and nothing more to find. You head for the room. You head from the room and back into the hallway. In the hallway, a young girl is standing, her hands clasped in front of her. Her flesh is slack and tinged green. One eye is missing and her patches of hair are like straw. She smiles up at you but her chest is quite still. She's not breathing. Clearly some kind of undead manifestation. The ghost dances from foot to foot. Terribly hard to write a note in our condition, you see, but he managed it all the same. He's stubborn like that. The furniture was easier. I helped a bit with that. She stares at you and a worm crawls out of her empty eye socket. It slivers across her face and burrows into her ear. She is not the first ghost you've met, of course, but she is somewhat worse in somewhat worse condition than Lorag was when you met him at the gates of Card. Who are you talking about? My friend Fildrick, she says. He's around here somewhere, though he sleeps more than I do, but I don't worry. Worry about what? Oh, us haunting or possessing you. Whatever it is you worry about when the dead walk. Neither of us mean any harm. Do you encounter many travellers? Of course I can't trust her. She's a ghost. Very few come this way now that the inn is shut down. But the few that do most avoid this place. I spy them hurrying by once every few years. When did the inn close? 
Time is difficult for me, but I remember the tall rock by the door was much pointier than it is now. You recall the one she means, though the tip of that rock is a smooth curve. It was simply the rain and wind where if it was simply the rain and wind wearing it down, she might be speaking of centuries or longer. The note said this place was haunted. You tell her. The note is a fake, but not that part, the girl replies. It is haunted, but we're not horrors. How did you die? You ask. Oh, it's too horrible to repeat, she replies cheerfully. But I'll tell you where. And she points a finger downwards. I'm not sure I deserved it. Is Fildrick dead too? He'd better be. Oh, yes, very much so. He died after I did, I think. Why are you haunting this place? I'm stuck here, she says. I cannot leave. A curse? You say? She wails. But why would someone curse me? I've never harmed anyone. Could, 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 I, could I ask you a favour? The girl says, the worm peeking out of her ear. Oh, it's got back round to the ear again. You may ask, but it doesn't mean I'm going to do it. You reply, I may not grant what you ask. Oh, that's fair, she replies seriously. But it's a simple thing. I've been trapped here for so long, but I believe you can help free me. Then a voice booms from the front room. Stop right there! Just then, a second ghost strides into the hall. I'll look him up and down. He is, or was, a well-built young man. A hooded robe, now ta in tatters, clings to his frame. Almost like a more ruined version of the one I now wear. The skin of his arms is frayed like cloth in places, and white bone peeks through. You will leave! He shouts at you. Never return! To stay is to invite death! Didn't you read the note? Nonsense, the girl retorts. This mortal can help us. We will be free. I'll say nothing. I don't want to volunteer help. I don't want to... Yeah, just remain neutral for now. Fildrick ignores the girl and fixes you with a cold glare. Do not be mistaken, fool. You would do best to leave now. Why do you want me to leave? See, this would be the great time to cast a Howl spell. Because the dead and the living should not meet. The girl rolls her sunken eyes. Only because you scare them away. I just want to talk to people, but you chase them away. Is that true? Fildrick nods. Yes, but only to prevent the girl from soliciting your aid. She wants to leave so badly, but we must not. Will you help us? The girl pleads, turning her big round eye sockets to you. Fildrick shakes his head. No, no, you must leave. We are the dead and you should be afraid of us. Well, see, here's the thing. I am allegedly a powerful sorcerer, not a monk. In fact, if I am a monk, I probably shouldn't be that afraid of you. Or maybe I should. Ooh. What keeps you here? An old spell, the girl says, but a simple one. You are very knowledgeable for a little girl who said she never hurt anyone. The girl attempts to shrug. I pick things up having been here for so long. A strange expression crosses Fildrick's face. You have been here longer than me. That is that true? I don't trust either of them, to be honest. Now I'm being forced to take a side. Right. This definitely feels like it's some kind of nasty trap. But it also feels like... Right. Upon, upon initial presentation it seems like he is overreacting to the situation and stereotyping it and she's saying oh come on lighten up we don't have to stay here we should just be allowed to go free but she's trying to get me to stay here and do something and cast some kind of spell allegedly which she suddenly now knows all about 
he could be trying to protect us from her but not be very good at presenting himself right he might just be, you know not be very good at trying to put his ideas across and explain himself um she does appear to be some well, well she started more innocent but now now this twist when she says oh she knows all about it I mean, yeah, she's been here a long time. She's had a lot of time to think about it. But it feels like it's trying to lure me in, to trap me. And if I follow his advice and I just leave as he desires, what? But Right. If I stay, something bad could happen to me. If I depart, what bad thing could occur to me? I go to leave and... What if the curse has already affected me? I go to the door. She's cursed me. I can't open the door. I can't leave the building. Even though I've blown the door up with a fireball. Burned it to bits. You know, it's, if, if, if I'm now stuck here and I need to do this same spell she wants to free them and release them so they can go to get myself out of here, then I'd be forced to come back. And uh, I, so... I do not trust you, Fildrick. I should. I can still rewind for now. I do not trust you, Fildrick. I care not, he shouts suddenly. I just want you gone. The young girl leads you and Fildrick towards the common room, beckoning as she goes. This is not going to end well. You follow her, Fildrick cursing and muttering to himself, chasing threads of memory. Once in the common room, the girl points to a musty roll of parchment stuffed underneath an old crate. What is it? I imagine I'll be finding out what it is pretty soon, but I want to know what she says it is. Are you slow? she demands, suddenly momentarily cruel. This is the spell. Get on with it! Now this could be a trap. You pick up the roll of parchment. It is cracked with age, but still readable. It describes a simple counterspell to the binding enchantment that has been placed on the tavern. You could perform it with ease. After Fildrick managed to write the note a few decades ago, I copied out the spell, the girl says. The old one was useless and in the wrong language. Fildrick is becoming increasingly agitated. Why was it in the wrong language? And if so, how did you learn the right language? And this feels more like a trap. But how did you get it? A traveller left it behind, she says. Uh, uh, highly suspicious. Fildrick shakes his head. That does not make sense. The counterspell would have been have to be tailored to the enchantment. It must have been created, but I cannot remember by who. Does it matter? The girl snaps. It will work, right? Will you perform it for us? The girl tries to yank at your arm, but her fingers pass through your elbow. Why do you believe this will work? You demand. The girl looks at you with bug big round eyes. It has to, she murmurs. It just has to. Ooh, I'd better see what I'm getting into here. You glance down at the spell, but it is a star graph and nothing more. There is no clue as to what stars it binds or with what affordances. It might have any effect. Mm. Seriously risky. This feels very long. As I mentioned, this does feel like a trap. But I'm very much of a feeling that I've come this far and I might as well find out what it is. This is a feeling I cannot afford to indulge too much in the future. But I do feel at the moment, slightly, that I may still be doing a good thing. You nod. I will perform the spell, you say. 
You examine the parchment as the girl squeals of delight. No! Fildrick's voice fills a room. His rotten corpse now is tall enough to reach the ceiling. He looms over you, poised to strike. You must not break the spell! You will not! Can't I just cast a resurrection spell with my holy water? I will recite the spell and see what happens. You recite the spell. Yeah, this is like an exorcism for him, but not for her, isn't it? Fildrick's howling in frustration as you begin. He does nothing to stop you, however, a little girl dances around you of delight, and then I am trapped here to be a ghost just like them. Am I right? You finish the spell and detect a faint shimmering near the door. Fildrick quietly floats over to the door. Is that it? the girl asks. I expected something more dramatic. Well, magic is only flashy when required. You say. Fildrick's voice is distant. You are correct. I believed that too and constructed my spells for efficiency. The girl strides to the door, her form lengthening with each step. Her child's clothes begin to resemble a great cloak, her fingers morphing into claws. When she steps over the threshold, she is a head taller than Fildrick, swirled in a deep blackness. A death wraith. The deaf wraith turns to you before she leaves. Thank you, human. It has been far too long since I tore a soul from a still warm body, but your gullibility aided me, so I will reward you with your life. Fildrick chokes back a sob as the monster vanishes into the darkness. I was right. Yeah, I thought so. I thought it was sus. I ask what it is. She did raise my suspicion. Pick it up. How did you get it? A traveller left it. Fildrick's making much more sense here, and I did say this looked like a trap. How can you be sure it works? She just... Yeah. I will not do this. Fildrick breathes a sigh of relief. The girl pouts. The corners of her mouth begin to droop past her chin. The room is cooling suddenly. The young girl begins to elongate, limbs blending into the shadows of the room. Fildrick backs away, his ghostly form even more insubstantial than usual. Useless mortals, she says. Your kind are only good for one thing. Her voice grows jagged as she advances on you. I will cast a flipping spell, because I suspect I may be trapped in here. I got my sun gem, so, uh, yeah. Protection from magic. Nope. Well, why give me the first letter? It must be a secret spell. I don't know the rest of it. What? Okay, so I can make a force field. That won't last forever, however. Could pop a rock. Um, a wraith rock. Not ideal. Wall. Okay, password, force field or invisible wall? Zap. Might work. So. Fof, um... Could I wall her into a corner? Is it, can I essentially contain her for as long as it takes for me to get out of the building? There's a G here. Come on. Really now? Are there that many secret spells at this point? So... Zap, pop, fof, or wall. Let's look at counters. Specifically fof and wall. Um, wait, wait, wait. Wall counters pop. So pop counters wall. Invisible wall in front of the cast of this wall is impervious to all missiles, creatures, or other material 
objects. The wraith may be immaterial. Fourth, physical barrier in front of the caster is capable of keeping out all intruders. The resulting force field is both extremely strong and flexible. The fact that I'm presented with both of these means that either both will have the same effect or both will have different effects. If both will have different effects, what would the difference be, right? Why would it matter that one would be successful and the other would fail? I'm getting a feeling these would both fail. This powerful spell creates capable of keeping out all intruders. It's a physical barrier, invisible wall in front of the caster. Um, hmm. Um, I mean, I'll just run out of here, but she might hit me as I go. So, um, cast a spell. Sure. Let's examine these again. Right. This is likely to damage the building, which is more likely to hurt me than it is her or the ghost of Fildrick. Huh. Why? Why are both of these presented? Neither requires an item, so they're both just a stamina dump. Um. I can't remember. Death Wraith's like completely immune to magic or something? That would be weird. Um. Zap counter Zen. So. This feels like the kind of finesse situation. Well, it feels like raw combat is coming, but it also feels like the kind of finesse situation where a direct damage spell is the least likely to be effective. Fourth or wall. Both feel wrong. Nothing from the H. Nothing from the M. I suspect there's some kind of secret spell I've missed here that I'm supposed to be used, which is the M or the F. Uh, the M or the H. So we got pop, fof, wall, and zap. Uh, lightning against virtually all living creatures without a magical defense. Yeah, not good. So, it's not living and it may have some magical defense. And it needed a magic weapon to hurt, didn't it? So, thing is, why can't I cast magic protection? That's weird. Uh, of course, with great mental concentration, the spell must be cast on small pebbles and produce as loud as it make a loud bang, lots of noise. Um, so, the question is, if I use one of these spells to protect myself, will I be blocking myself in? Physical barrier, does it move with me? I'm not sure that it does. Wall doesn't move, right? Um, force field is extremely strong and flexible, hence it is a very useful defensive spell. Um, well, let's read that again. Advances on you. Um, Yeah, but where am I? Am I in the corner of a room? Am I trapped in what? Um, let's get really risky. Look, I don't have a lot of good options here. 
You cast a spell, forming a shimmering force field around your body. You should be protected from all but the most serious blows now. Okay, so it's like an armor suit rather than a... Okay, okay, okay. I'll attack. I hopefully still have the silver sword. You leap at the goal of your sword, but your slash goes straight through her. I literally have a better sword that could do a better job. Her fingers lanky and black are lanky and black and brush your cheek. The touch burns like ice. Yeah, I'm out of here. You turn to flee, seeing Fildrick's pained expression. Go! he shouts. As you near the door, the girl reaches out with impossibly long limbs to grasp your arm. She caresses your arm, and the mere touch is enough to shatter your force field, but nothing more results. There is no alternative. You race out of the building, leaving the dead behind. If I had said I don't trust her, I think she would have gone straight for the attack. But he might have had some force against her. You race away from the tavern once more. The only way is back. Yeah, I'm not going there again anytime soon. And it's literally called back. You return down the ruined path. The wind picks up as the evening draws on. Then suddenly you feel a wave of nausea. The ground beneath you shifts. The sun slides sideways. I am not good. I've been touched by a death wraith. This cannot be well. Cast a spell. You reach out your arm to cast a spell when you fall. The world rushes past you, further than it should. You hear a woman's voice singing gently above the sound of lapping waves. What magic is this? No. Back in book one. Waves lull and wash towards a shore. Lapping water. This is messed up. You lie on a bed of stones, looking up at the bright sunlight. Where am I? This is not high salmon. A feeling of dread creeps over you. What kind of trap is this? How far have you travelled? I will stand up. You pick yourself to your feet, woozy as though you have been asleep for some time. Greetings, murmurs a voice, warm and welcoming. We have travelled a long way together, you and I. Who are you? You call, turning your head, but seeing nothing beyond the washing sea. I have many names, she replies, but none truly describe who I am. The sea washes over your boots, as though inviting you to step forwards. I must go back. You shall, the voice assures you. You shall. A gentle wind tugs at your coat. You are standing on the shore of the Kakabad Sea, barely a half-day's walk from Analand. The shore of a cave. Well, we're on the shore, so let's explore. You crouch towards the shore. In the glinting water, a boat slowly rocks to and fro, and in the boat sits a woman with a loom. A loom? So like some kind of fate weaver. Why did you bring me here? She's already... No point asking what she wants me to call her. She's already said she's... Yeah, Libra, as I thought. We have walked a long road together, she replies. Perhaps you did not know it, but that road is almost at an e its end. I bring you here to deliver a warning. I am Libra, goddess of justice, and our long road together has almost reached its end. Her voice is filled with sadness. I have kept you safe many times, saved you, but I can do no more. Yeah, so in the original books, you could call upon Libra for aid once per book. Uh, and instead of this whole spirit animal thing, although the god Korga, you could change worship to Korga or Slang, the god of lies. Slang did literally nothing for you, but blocked you from being able to get other gods. I'll allow her to speak. Look, she's a goddess. I'm not going to contradict her. 
I know you do not understand, she continues, but you will soon enough. When you enter Mampang, you will understand. The walls around that citadel have more than, are more than those of physical stone. It is a cursed place, guarded by sigils and long knives. You mean to say that you cannot enter? You are right, but perhaps you do not understand the cost, Analanda. For as long as you have walked, I have walked beside you. I have granted you waking dreams, dreams of your future, dreams from which you wake to walk a different way. Visions, you mean? You remember no such thing. That's a literal lie. She's given me dreams virtually every time I... Oh, waking dreams, the goddess replies. The kind that seem real until they disappear as though they had never been. She shoots the shuttle across her loom once more. Oh, she is, she's one of those weavers. The ones who are good enough that they can just throw it across from side to side. And I just bang my microphone stand there. <laughs> you know, just sling it across from one side, adjust. You know, it's like chuck, pedal, chuck, pedal, chuck, pedal. Those are advanced, well-skilled weavers. But no more. Once inside the walls of Mampang, your future will become precious once again. So no rewinds. The word strikes a knell of fear into your heart. You mean hardscore old-school gaming? Bring it on! Tell me what you mean. You ask, bowing your head in respect. A weave can be made and then unmade and made again in different fashion. The final garment goes, does not know how many times it was stitched. So it has been with your journey, she laughs. <laughs> or perhaps you consider yourself to simply have been lucky to have survived so far. A large wave reaches the shore, and as it drains, the boat tilts and begins to drift away. The woman makes no move to stop it, merely continuing to weave, and I'll let her go. Don't fight it, it's fate. You steady yourself and watch as she drifts away. The thought of the long journey back to Mampang begins to sink into your mind. Into the water. The water's taking her away, I think, away. I think I need to go the other way. I also don't think I'm physically here. Into the cave, then. What's the point in trying to follow her when she's going away from me, right? You step away from the water, towards the mouth of a dim cave. Inside, the stone drips salty tears. These tunnels must be flooded at high tide. A look around. The cave walls are jagged and irregular, formed by lashing waves and shifting rocks of a thousand years. Here and there, crystal seams wink from deep within the frozen stone folds. I shall go deeper. You push deeper into the cave, climbing over fallen stones, following the line of the deepest darkness up into the towering cliffside. Somewhere overhead are the low hills around Cantapani, and a short distance above that is your home. You climb higher still, upwards into the rock, then something in the distance begins to roar and moan. You are not alone in the darkness. I will cast a spell. Ah, here we go. You open your arms to cast a spell as a great wind begins to rush through the tunnel, gathering its strength and force as it tries to push you back. Your arms are pushed apart and their power unbinds before it can form. Can I pray? Probably, no, it'd probably be given as an option. As you begin to fall, the stars reach down to catch you and transport me back to here. You are back on the cliff path. Was that real? I'd better believe it was. There's a strange taste in my mouth. There is no way I'm going back towards the inn. <laughs> there is still a taste of salt in your mouth, but nothing more. 
probably a similar experience if I'd gone out to sea, to be honest. You shake the vision away and look around yourself once more. You have been walking these paths in circles for days now. Time to make progress. Surely, real or not, you must keep moving. That's not a peak, that's a, a cursed inn. And there is a bridge I must not take. You follow the path south once more. Look, I'm dressed as a monk. I met a goddess. I meet a being of the divine. This is perfect. I wonder, actually, if not wearing the monk's robe would have delayed that encounter until I got much closer to the gates of Mampang itself or put it on. Probably not, but it does feel oddly, you know, thematic. You follow the path southwards once more. The chasm yawns open on your right-hand side. The sun has almost set and the sky has turned a deep purple. There's smoke on the water, probably some fire in the sky somewhere. It'll be night soon. A narrow rope bridge leans south across the ravine from here. I will not take it. I will not. Do not cross the bridge. It's like Aladdin's cave, you know? The, what did the evil uncle say to Aladdin before he went into the cave? Touch nothing yet. He says you were coming through a cave full of gold, rubies, diamonds, you know, gold, silver, coins. Touch nothing yet. You will come into a cave full of rubies, diamonds, emeralds. Touch nothing yet. You will come into a cave, and so on, until you get to the cave with just the dusty old lamp. And then pick that up, bring that back, and nothing else. And Aladdin remembers the warnings to touch nothing yet, and he does not, for if he did, he would have been trapped there and unable to leave. Which the magician doesn't tell him until he gets outside. But, wait, 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 doesn't... Oh! But, he, no, he takes too long. No, no, because he does take the treasure. And so the, the stone rolls back over the entrance, and the magician curses him because he doesn't come out quickly enough. He's like, throw up a lamp to me, and then I'll... And he, and he doesn't. He wants to... He wants to be let out first. He says, no, no. He's like, give me the lamp. Yeah, I remember now. And then he summons the genie and the genie helps him out there. Yeah, 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 yeah. You leave the bridge behind and make your way around the edge of the chasm. The path splits here, sneaking around the edge of a mountain while a branch works its way downwards towards the stone tower. Well, it is getting dark and I do need somewhere to rest. That is not. The tower's over here. You pick your way down the scree slope, one step at a time. You stand by the ruined tower once more. The path continues in both directions and the tower is open to you. Look, if I'm going to rest, I'll pray for healing. I wonder if Korga's power will also be of no aid to me inside Mampang. I'd better avail myself of it now. I will enter the tower. And it has been suggested to me that maybe I should climb those broken steps. Maybe. You step behind the fallen blocks of a ruined tower once more. Maybe there will be something at the top of those steps, like a crystal that has fallen from one of the brass telescope thingies. You wind your way up the stairs to about halfway up the tower's height. The stairs end a few paces further on. They have been sheared off by the same force that ruined the entire roof of the tower. I'll advance right to the edge, but not beyond. You step carefully to the broken edge of the steps. The stairs. Two more steps, taking one each one at a time in case the, tower, the stone should give way under your weight. After three steps you stop. The broken edge of the stairs are now one step away. You know what? This is so tempting. In case it's actually not a ruin and the steps still exist and take me to some magical place at the top of the tower. And I have just got six stamina back, so if I fall a long way down. You take another step. And then another. And then another. Still climbing. Looking back, the stairs behind you seem quite intact. 
Looking in front, they are once again only a couple before they fall to ruin. And yet, with every step you make, it seems more steps appear. I'll be watching them. Did, did you get that? You know, I'll be watching you. Was that a little bit too um, vague? Hmm. I will walk up the stairs and see where they lead. You pace step by step up the tower, spiralling around and around until finally you reach a trapdoor in the non-existent roof. This is so sus. You push the trapdoor open and step out onto the roof of the tower. I'm literally going into the past here. The wind whistles past your head, ruffling your hair. You are standing high above the pass, atop a tower that was not here when you passed through the path below. I will look at the tower. A brass beacon of the kind you have seen before stands here. There is a faint shimmer of magic in the air here. You know, I could restore the inn and go and rest there, but I don't have enough money. At first glance, the beacon seems quite intact, but there is no light shining from it now. You step away from the trapdoor and walk out across the roof. Away from the trapdoor, walk across the roof. You head over to the edge of the tower, just by the end of the large brass lantern. I'll look out across the land. You look out across the land, towards a deep crater in the earth that is split like a bleeding sore by a black hissing vent in the ground. No doubt this hell hole is the quarry used to build the city citadel that lies beyond. Look at the citadel. Obviously, it's, it's drawing my attention. It's obviously the whole big panoramic scene. Mampang itself dominates the skyline, enough to chill the hardest of hearts. At its top is a tower with a single high window, the Archmage's turret room. I wonder if I could shine the beacon on the gates, cause them to not exist, walk through and be inside. Probably not. I will now look at the beacon. Looking back at the lantern, you are surprised to see that there is indeed a very faint light spilling from its end. It seems its beam is active, but it has been focused into an extremely narrow beam that reaches across empty space towards something in the distance. And what do I see if I follow that beam? You follow the beam with your eyes, and of course you see immediately where it points. The central tower of Mampang. And why would that be... Wait. Is this how the sorcerer, the, the Archmage, gets his unnaturally long life? He's literally just using the beacon to be in multiple time zones at once, like to constantly travel into the future. That feels... I don't think I should move this. I don't think I'll be able to. I'll now look down over the edge. I should have probably looked down, then it would be then out. Looking out over the edge, you have a surprise. The tower below is still not there. Wait. Wait, 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 wait. What if the beacon's not coming from the tower, but to the tower? And if the beacon is coming to the tower, why would the Archmage want to keep the top of the tower in its previous condition so that someone could report back to him from here? Possibly the troll. I doubt it was the troll who was at the bottom of the tower. Looking down, you see nothing but ruin and rubble, and yet, under your feet, the planks are quite sound and solid. You step back from the edge of the tower. You hear a quiet cough from somewhere behind you. <coughs> Who's there? You call, but there is no reply. That has appeared. No, I won't descend. I will go look at the beacon again, first. You move over to the eye of the beacon. A shimmering blue crystal is set at the end of it. That wasn't here before. Who snuck up here and repaired the beacon while I was out looking at the roof and the landscape around? 
I should probably not do this. This feels like a trap. I can turn it off. I can... Ooh. And fall down to the... No, 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 no. If I turn... Right. If I... it Look, it's pointed right at the Archmage's Tower. If I turn it away from his tower, he is going to notice. So I could go visit him in the past, find out why he's so scared of me, cause him to be so scared of me, come back and meet him in the future. Yeah, I should probably not mess with this. I could obviously go turn it to point at the, um, at the inn. Is this a state I'm supposed to change? Probably not. Look, I was just looking for somewhere to sleep, okay? And it's going all the way over here, up, up, up to here. This looks very... Doesn't look as labyrinthine as I remember the fortress being. I remember it being more sort of internal with a roof over it, so like st stuff in... Not, um like a city, a whole city, but that kind of makes sense though in many ways. Um, I feel that I can come back here and change things if I want to, but for now I should just leave it as it is. I go to the inn, I say, hey, hey, there's some nasty person going to come here and cast spells and ruin everything and turn one of you into a death reef. And they'll go, you horrible person, skip... Wait. The spell to let the Death Wraith out of the inn was left there at the inn by a traveller in the past. It could literally be me. I could go there and create the spell of warding that prevents her from leaving. And then be forced to leave the scroll behind that she won't understand. It would be in the wrong language. But then how did she translate it? into a language I could read. No, so someone else would have to do it. Probably Fildrick. Um, I'm moving away from the beacon. You step away from the beacon. Just then, a robed figure steps out of, from a shadowy spot behind the lantern. I've been waiting to meet you. You approach the figure boldly, while dressed as a monk. I have looked... I have been inquisitive. I have pondered things on a matter of knowledge. I did call out who's there when he made himself known to me. So I don't think I've blown my cover. Greetings, it declares. And what are you doing here? Greetings. The figure nods. You seem remarkably intact, it observes. Because of the falling down to the ground potential thing or it could be the archmage he could have literally come along the beam of energy beam of energy i doubt it though intact indeed it is most curious since the lower floors of this tower are home to more than one mind snake and i would not travel expect any traveler to simply walk in I saw no snakes. I'm not afraid of mind snakes, and he might go, you're a monk, you wouldn't be that foolish. Or he'd be like, yeah, you're right, you're a monk. That that, that double trick there of a lower floor is a ruin. <clears throat> to say I saw no serpents doesn't mean they weren't there. I saw no snakes. No, indeed, replies the creature. Mind snakes are hardly visible. But their sharp end is quite sharp and usually quite hungry. Are you not afraid of them yourself? I am terribly afraid of them, obviously. The creature strokes its sharp chin. All in all, this situation is most unexpected. Let me ask you a few questions. Indeed, the creature returns in some surprise. Indeed. 
I have seen beacons like this before. You tell the creature. This is the last of the great beacons built across the backlands, the creature guarding the tower declares. They are lenses, and like all lenses they collect, focus, and deliver. Only they do not focus and deliver light. No, they focus and deliver images of time. There is something strange about the creature's speech, as though the conversation was happening out of its proper order which could hilariously mean I just chose the wrong option, but that's not necessarily what it means. It means he's distorted and refracted by spending so long around this beacon. They focus time. Indeed, that is correct. You are funneling time to Mampang. You reply, for what purpose? For my master, the Archmage. He lifts a finger to his forehead reverentially. He desires immortality. It cannot be achieved, but extreme longevity is a close second. I don't need to antagonise this fellow. Where can I find him? That's pretty obvious, but... In his tower, of course. That is where this last beacon shines. And where he sits to drink in the light. When I entered this tower, it was ruined. You explain. The watching creature cocks its hooded head and considers that with some interest. Remarkable, it breathes. I sense the truth in your words, though I cannot understand them. Perhaps I should summon a snake up here to test your assertions. The creature nods to you. I must resume my calculations, he declares. You nod in return. If you survived your journey up my tower, no doubt you will survive the journey down. Now if I go to the beacon and go turn it off, he won't like it. I'm just gonna leave now. As I said, you know, turning off this beacon... Definitely going to get the Archmage's attention. You return to the trapdoor and make your way back down the stairs, which disappear behind you as you go. Can I, um, is there a downstairs? Oh, nope, nope. Okay, fine. You are back in the ruined tower. Apparently I can't sleep here. The wind howls for a broken structure above, and apparently I'm going to be walking through the night again. You step away from the ruin once more. Ah, uh, well. Yeah, it's way past midnight. You're back outside the tower. The path continues in both directions. Well, interesting. You climb up onto the cliff path. Another night begins. Begins? We're way past the midnight hour. Another song reference! My goodness, they're all coming this episode, aren't they? You should try to find a place to sleep. The path splits here, sneaking around the edge of a mountain, while a branch works its way downwards towards the stone tower. Which way now? I wonder if I had tried to refocus it over here. I mean, this curve would have probably prevented me somewhat, and he, would, he probably would have come out and said, you're not supposed to do that. Well, this feels risky. The trail winds through the mountain. You follow it until a straight sight ahead makes you stop. Higher up the rocky cliffs perches a strange structure made of twigs, branches and moss. You could almost say it's a nest. But that, I fear, will have to wait until the very next episode, for I feel this one has gone on for quite long enough. I hope you've all enjoyed this episode, and I do hope you'll all join me once again in the next one. I'm going to say goodbye for now, though, and cheerio, everyone. See you all next time.